Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. My name is Saurabh Sharma. We are doing the introduction to Chinese studies course. Today we are going to do the second lecture titled Mandate of Heaven and Rise and Fall of Dynasties. Now the concept of Mandate of Heaven is a very important political concept in China. It occurs in the famous book of documents which consists of 58 chapters dealing with early period of Chinese history. It deals with uh, the mythical kings followed by the Xia and Shang dynasties and also the early Zhou dynasty period. In this lecture, we are going to try to understand the Chinese state from the beginning till now in the light of the concept of Mandarin heaven and also try to apply this concept to the international level to find how China sees its position in the world today. So before going into the concept, we must under, uh, we need to clear certain things. As you can see here, there are a few Chinese characters in front of you. This is Thian or heaven. This concept was introduced by the Zhou dynasty. Thian refers to the sky. Thian means the sky. It also is a deity in, in, in Chinese civilization. So the ancient uh, Shang people, the Shang dynasty used to worship Shangti as the highest god. Uh, the Zhou dynasty introduced a new concept called Thian. Now Thian, unlike say a personal god whom you pray to, who, who bestows you with uh, certain uh, rewards or who um, gives you some commandments, Thian is a more impersonal in nature. It's, it's like a cosmic law that governs everything. All other gods are subordinate to Thian. Every, everyone, every being acts according to the law of heaven. Thian is heaven or sky. Now, this is very interesting. It, it, is, it is very close to the Vedic concept of rhythm. Rhythm, uh, so the word Ritu comes from rhythm. It's, it's like seasons. So heaven is something like that. Something which is constantly moving. It is constantly changing and governing the way the world X. Now the emperor in, in this particular cosmology is known as Tian Zi. means the son of heaven. So emperor acts as, as an intermediary between heaven and earth. So the emperor on behalf of, of humanity performs certain rituals to, to satisfy heaven. He also acts according to, to the conduct approved by heaven. And so long he, as he does that, the heaven bestows all the uh, good things upon society. Okay, so instead of say uh, a, a person doing a personal prayer and getting some gift from heaven, it, it is the state which acts on behalf of the people. So state here is the emperor. Now in return for being uh, uh, the intermediary to, to heaven, the emperor gets the right to rule over the world. That is known as Tianxia. Tianxia. All under heaven. So the earth is all under heaven. So everything under heaven is the jurisdiction of the Chinese emperor according to this concept. Not only the Chinese people or the Huaxia people, but entire humanity is under the jurisdiction of the son of heaven. Of course, the responsibilities are different with regards to different types of people. So it's not a kind of a egalitarian type of a system, but a hierarchical system. And uh, that mandate given to the emperor by heaven is known as Tianming or mandate of heaven. Okay. And this is not permanent. It has certain characteristics. Uh, so we are going to discuss that. So let's look into uh, those points. Now, first, how this, did this concept originate? How did this concept of mandate of heaven come into being. So in 1046 BCE, the Zhou dynasty overthrew the Shang dynasty. Now Shang dynasty had been ruling China for centuries. So China at this point of time 
was basically the area around the Yellow River. Okay, so the Yellow River uh, is basically the originating area of the Chinese civilization. And uh, so the Shang dynasty ruled the, the area around the Yellow River. So Chou dynasty, which was a, a, a neighboring dynasty, it conquered the that territory, overthrew the Shang dynasty and came to power. So although they came to power, they did not eliminate the Shang elite completely. Instead, what did they do? They tried to placate them. They gave them some, uh, some titles, also some land to rule over. As a result, they ensured that the Shang do not oppose their rule. Okay, so, so they co-opted the previous dynasty. They were given several titles. Uh, for example, Confucius is considered to be a descendant of Shang dynasty. Okay, so, so, so this was a policy of the Chou dynasty. Now the argument uh, Chou dynasty made was the right to rule over people is not permanent. It is something which is dependent on the will of heaven. So long as heaven desires, you can rule over people. But as soon as the heaven withdraws its, its will, then you no longer have the right to people. It, it, it is transferred to some other dynasty, some other ruler. So because the last ruler of Shang dynasty was corrupt, he was not a good king, therefore the heaven was dissatisfied with him and therefore the mandate was withdrawn. And so the Cho have now got the mandate because they, they, they are better in governing over, over the land than the Shang dynasty. Okay, so that was the justification. They also argued that it is nothing new. The Shang dynasty was also established by overthrowing a previous dynasty, the Xia dynasty. Okay, so the first dynasty was the Xia dynasty. So Xia dynasty was founded by Yu, the, the great emperor. Uh, he, he founded the Xia dynasty. He basically controlled the floods in the Yellow River. And therefore, Xia dynasty had the mandate of heaven. But the last king of the Xia dynasty was again corrupt and inept. And therefore, the founder of the Shang dynasty overthrew the last Xia king and established the Shang dynasty. So the Chou dynasty is not doing something new. It is only repeating what the Shang dynasty itself had done. Okay, so there was nothing wrong in the overthrow of the Shang dynasty and establishing the rule of the Chou dynasty. Now, what are some of the features of the mandate of heaven? So, I have uh, uh, basically pointed out here uh, four points. The first point is heaven grants the emperor the right to rule. Okay, so the right to rule does not come from the people, it does not come from use of force, it does not come from tradition, it does not come from heredity. It basically comes directly from heaven. Okay, and so how would you know that you have got the right to rule? That you can know by, by the situation in society. If, if there are some problems in society, there are rebellions, there are natural calamities, that means that particular dynasty has lo lost the mandate of heaven. And if uh, the society is prosperous, the administration is smooth, that means that dynasty retains the mandate of heaven. So heaven grants the emperor the right to rule. Second point is, since there is only one heaven, there can be only one emperor. So, because emperor is the son of heaven, there, there aren't multiple sons of heaven. There is only one son of heaven. There is only one intermediary between the earth and heaven. So, in the Chinese cosmological thinking, China is actually at the center of the world. And this is also understood by the Chinese name for China, Chung Kuo. Chung Kuo means the middle kingdom. Okay, the middle Chung Kuo is the middle kingdom. So the Chinese people call China as Chung Kuo or the middle kingdom. So the Chinese view is hierarchical in nature that China is superior to other nations and other nations are inferior to China. So even in modern times, say right now, the Communist Party of China rules over, over China and so there is no dynasty. But if, if you look at uh, uh, it from a cosmological point of view, the Chinese Communist Party is like a dynasty ruling over China. It has the mandate of heaven right now. 
and the goal of, of the Chinese Communist Party is to establish a Sinocentric world order. Okay, because there is one party, so that there, there is one heaven, there is one earth, so there is one party, one dynasty which has the mandate of heaven. The third, uh, third point is virtue determines the right to rule. So, if someone say wants to rule over China or rule over the people, what determines it? How, how does heaven decide? It decides on the basis of virtue. The ruler has to be virtuous. The ruler has to follow certain rules, certain customs, certain traditions. It has to, it needs such a form of legitimacy in order to have the mandate of heaven. And this is often decided by social relations. The king has to be benevolent to the people. The king has to provide for the people. So, in ancient China, there used to be this uh, uh, system, granary system. So, the, the rulers used to store food grains because uh, there were droughts and so on. Uh, and, and, and during those conditions, when there was scarcity of food, there was famine, the rulers would open those granaries and provide food to the people. So, this was considered to be a benevolent act. So, you had to maintain the granaries. You have to keep the granaries full and for that you need, needed agricultural production. So, the, the, it was the duty of the emperor to be benevolent to the people. Another important point was glory. The emperor was supposed to expand the Chinese power. So, this, this, this idea of legitimacy this is a very good article written by Vivian Shu. So, she argues that basically there are three important uh, components of legitimacy in China. First is benevolence, second is glory and third is truth. So, the emperor needs to maintain all these three virtues or say that today the Chinese state, the communist party has to maintain these things. So, benevolence basically means prosperity. So, in today's terms, it will be economic development. So, the, so uh, in a democratic country, the right of a government to rule over people comes through elections. The people themselves elect the government. But China is not a democratic country. It is an authoritarian country. It is under one party rule. So, how does uh, the communist party ensure that it continues to rule and uh, receive the support of the people? It does so through economic development. It provides people economic development, jobs and so on. And so, so, so long as China is developing economically, the communist party rule in China is legitimate for the people. The second is glory. Now, glory basically refers to China's position in the world. So, in ancient times, it would refer to the tributary system that large number of neighboring countries or neighboring people would kowtow, kowtow Chinese emperor. Kowtow means to hit your he head on the floor. Okay, So, you bow down before the Chinese emperor. So, so the glory of China was determined by how many peoples, how many states, how many neighbors accept the, the greatness of Chinese civilization and send them gifts and in return China of course provides them protection and gifts and so on. And that can uh, still be seen in modern times where China, the Chinese foreign policy is geared towards uh, unequal relations. So, the, China prefers a relation where they, they provide investments in, in, in countries, in return those countries follow the Chinese line. They become supporters of China international, internationally and they do not criticize any say human rights violations or whatever problems are happening inside China. So, this is an unequal hierarchical relationship, the tributary system. The third is truth. Now, this is very interesting. So, Chinese state has traditionally represented truth itself. So, what is truth for the Chinese people? Because see, truth, there are many versions of truth. People have different interpretations of truth. Uh, in China, whatever the state says is the truth. State has complete control over information. So, the Chinese Communist Party, in the ancient time it was the Chinese emperor, used to control the information that was delivered to the public. Okay, so, so long as you follow the, the line of the state, you are a virtuous citizen and if you, if you disobey or you, 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 you profess a different kind of a interpretation or a different kind of a line, then you are considered to be a rebel. You have, you, have, you have gone against the state. You have rebelled against the state. 
For example, the persecution of Falun Kung. Falun Kung was a uh, religious sect it still uh, exists but not in China in China it has been banned okay because it had a kind of an alternative version of truth and and the Chinese state uh, traditionally have have uh, basically uh, you know funded scholars Confucian scholars and they conducted civil service exams okay so so you spend a lot of many years studying Confucian classics and there would be an exam if you pass the exam then you are offered very important position in the Chinese state this is a system of meritocracy, which has existed in, in China for a very long time. So uh, the current Communist Party also claims to follow a kind, kind of a similar type of a system. So all these things are considered, so benevolence, truth, glory, all these things are considered to be virtue. Uh, uh, and, and that uh, gives the, uh, the emperor the right to rule or right now it's the Communist Party the right to rule. The fourth point is no dynasty has the permanent right to rule. Okay, so the right to rule is not permanent. So there is a recognition of right to revolution. The Confucian philosopher Mencius, Mencius, you know, explains this concept: the right to revolution. So a ruler should not never think that. Just because he is the ruler, he can suppress the people. Because the mandate of heaven is conditional, it is not unconditional. If the ruler, ruling dynasty, ruling party, whichever, goes against the principles of virtue, then the he heaven can withdraw its mandate. And then it is justified for the people to overthrow that state and establish a new state or a, or a new dynasty or a new government. Okay, so that has been traditionally recognized in, in China. And often this change is, is coincide with uh, some kind of a natural calamity, some assassination, some, uh, uh, rib, uh, some kind of a religious movement and so on. And therefore you will see even now the Chinese Communist Party is very worried whenever there is a kind of a new religious sect coming up. I already mentioned Falun Kong or say there is a big earthquake or something like for example the 2008 Sichuan earthquake. Okay, the Chinese uh, officials were uh, panicking because, uh, you know, this is a huge earthquake and, and earthquakes generally uh, indicate a kind of a shift in the heaven, okay, according to the Chinese thinking. Of course, I am not saying the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party still believes in, in uh, the ancient myths, but still, you know, every civilization has certain values which have, they have inherited, certain uh, way of thinking, okay, so the, the, uh, the Chinese people still continue to retain some of these these influences right so so i have already mentioned the indications of change okay and change have happened time to time in china uh, so impact how what has been the impact of of the concept of man, uh, mandate of heaven now there is a very, very famous chinese novel known as romance of the three kingdoms romance of the Three Kingdoms. This this novel was uh, written by Luo Quan Chung. Now this is the first line of of that novel. It says, "The empire long divided must unite, and long united must divide." So this means that China has gone through the phases of unity and disunity. So China is disunited, then a, a ruler or a, or a leader emerges who unites China and then that unity is maintained for a, for a long time and then a time comes when this unity again collapses and China again disintegrates into smaller states. But that is also not permanent. Again China is reunited by a new leader. Okay, so this is a kind of a cyclical type of a concept. So uh, say in... in uh, uh, 221 BCE, uh, Sri Wangti, uh, Chin Sri Wangti, he, uh, you can see number four, Chin Sri Wangti, the first emperor, he united China. He uh, declared himself to the first emperor. Okay, he, he, in fact, he wanted to eliminate the past of China and wanted to, wanted Chinese history to begin from himself. And therefore, he, he, it is said that he buried 
460 Confucian scholars alive and then burned uh, all the old books. Of course, they, the books survived as we still have them. Uh, now, uh, the founder of communist China, Mao Zedong, Mao, he was very inspired by Sri Wangti. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between Mao and Sri Wangti. Both were very, uh, you know, not hesitant in, in using violence, in using repression to c rule over people. Both of them were military geniuses. They, they, they defeated their enemies and, and created a united China. So Mao also did that. Sri Wangti also did that. Both hated uh, the past. Okay, Mao hated uh, uh, ancient Chinese philosophy and ancient Chinese thought. He was, of course, a Marxist-Leninist. Uh, Sri Wangti also hated the past scholars, especially the Confucians. Mao also hated Confucius and, and the Confucian scholars. In fact, Mao used to boast that uh, I am greater. He used to say that he is greater than Sri Wangti because Sri Wangti only buried 460 scholars. Mao said, I have buried 400,000 scholars. Now, of course, it's not literal. He did not literally bury 400. Thousand that is four lakh scholars, but uh, during the anti-rightist campaign in 1957, he basically, you know, got hold hold of these scholars. They, he persecuted them. Some were killed. Some were sent to labor camps and so on. So basically, he uh, eliminated their careers, destroyed their careers, and punished them. Okay, so 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 in that sense, it is like burying them alive. Uh, yeah. So so China has been united by a certain ruler and then that unity has remained for some time. That means the mandate has remained. So, so uh, Sri Wangti was not able to rule over China. Uh, means after the death of Sri Wangti, his dynasty did not rule China for a very long time. It was replaced by the Han dynasty as you can see here. And then under Han dynasty for a long time, China remained a united empire. You can say the same thing with uh, for the Communist Party of China today. So Mao basically united China. He created the People's Republic of China. And even after the death of Mao, it has continued. Of course, the Chinese people believe that they are all descendants of Wang Ti or the Yellow Emperor. And after him, there are other mythical emperors. For example, uh, the most famous amongst them are Yao and Shun. Okay, these, these emperors ruled over China. The term emperor is used, used for them because these are deities. Okay, they are gods worshipped by the Chinese people. They are temples to these emperors. Uh, although they did not rule over, a, so we do not even know if they actually historically existed. They are all mythical characters. But anyhow, now the rule, uh, rule of these uh, great emperors was not hereditary. The, the, emperor chose the most meritorious person as the successor. Okay, so, so emperor Yao, he chose Shun as the successor and Shun, he in turn chose Yu as the successor. Okay, so Yu was the founder of the Xia dynasty. So after Yu, a dynastic rule was established. So Xia dynasty became the first hereditary dynasty to rule over China. Now this is what uh, traditional Chinese history says. There are many scholars who doubt the, the validity of these claims. Many say, in fact, uh, Xia dynasty never existed. They say that it was a creation of the Cho dynasty in order to justify their overthrow of the Shang dynasty. They created this whole story of, of, of the Xia dynasty and say, uh, claiming that Shang had overthrown the Xia dynasty and similarly, the Cho is overthrowing the Shang dynasty. So some scholars believe that. Others say there is no reason to doubt that a dynasty existed before the Shang dynasty. So they believe that Shia dynasty actually existed. So anyway, the, the official Chinese uh, version uh, of history that is appro approved by the government says that Shia dynasty came to power in 2070 BCE and it ruled till 1600 BCE. So last Shia king, Chie, Chie was the last Shia king. He was very corrupt. As a result, he was Unlike say you, you was the founder of Shia dynasty, who was very virtuous, and that's why he, he became the uh, he, was, he has the title of emperor, so he was called the emperor. Now, so what were some of his merits? For example, he uh, you is credited for 
controlling the floods of the Yellow River. So before him, uh, the earlier emperors tried to control the floods in the Yellow River. They tried to create embankments and so on, but they completely failed because the Yellow River was so huge. You know, whenever it flooded, it used to destroy the land and the crops. But you, he found a different way of controlling the river that was by building canals. He, he built irrigation canals. As a result, he diverted the water of the river to different parts of China. So it not only stopped the floods, it also ensured that other lands are also irrigated. As a result, increasing the agricultural land, increasing the agricultural output. As a result, population increased and so on and so forth. Besides, he also fought against uh, uh, neighboring tribes, defeated them. And because of that, Emperor Shun appointed him as the emperor after him. And you started the hereditary system. But his descendant, Chie, was not a very good ruler. And so, Chie was overthrown by Tang. Tang was the first Shang king. Okay, I am see, I am using two words here, emperor and king. Uh, now, emperor actually refers to a kind of a heavenly being. Because Shang and Xia territories were so small that it, it is not uh, right to call them the rulers as emperors. So that is why the first emperor is Shi Wangti because he ruled over such a huge territory. Even the Chou dynasty rulers, although they expanded the, the Chinese uh, state, uh, still uh, it is it's, it's very difficult to call them emperors. Perhaps in the later parts, uh, they could be called emperor in a kind of a uh, titular sense, not, not de facto emperors because they actually did in the later part of their rule, they did not actually rule over China, there were other kingdoms which existed. Uh, but anyway, they held a title of respect uh, among the different states and so uh, they might be called emperors. Anyhow, that is a, a debating point. Uh, so, Mandarin heaven passed from the Xia dynasty to the Shang dynasty in 1600 BCE. And Shang dynasty, of course, is, is we have a lot of archaeological evidence for them. So, there are some, something known as the oracle bones, which contain, uh, you know, prayers and divinations to different gods like Shangti. Uh, and it mentions the names of different Shang kings. So, it is historically established that Shang dynasty actually existed. Now, the concept of Mandarin heaven goes on to say that the last Shang king, T. Singh, he was the last Shang king, was corrupt just like Chi A was. T. Singh was also corrupt and weak and therefore, he was overthrown by the founder of the Chou dynasty or, or founder of the Chou rule over China, Wu. Okay, king Wu overthrew T. Singh and became the ruler. Now, Wu uh, that is the founder of the Chou dynasty. He died very soon and uh, he, was, he, he was succeeded by his son. Okay, he was succeeded by his son, Chang. Okay, Chang was his son, but he was a minor. And therefore, the governance part was taken over by his younger brother, Duke of Cho. Duke of Cho. Now, Duke of Cho is considered like a sage statesman type of a person. He is revered in China. He is also like a deity in China. Now, Duke of Cho, he was the actual ruler, but he never wanted to be the king himself. He retained his nephew as the ruler, Cheng as the ruler, while he introduced a lot of reforms in, in, in Chinese administration, in, in society. He was also a poet, a philosopher. In fact, it said the concept of Mandarin heaven was first given by Duke of Cho. Okay, he actually devised this whole concept of mandate of heaven and he also distributed land among the, the um, uh, elite class. So, thus he created a feudal system. Now, Mao Zedong hated Duke of Cho okay, because he's, for him uh, Duke of Cho was a regressive character. On the other hand, Confucius revered the Duke of Cho. He believed that that was the golden period of Chinese history and Confucius believed that uh, China should return to the times of Duke of Cho and people should be like sages like the Duke of Cho, right. So, so, so the Cho dynasty period was a very, very vibrant period in that sense. It was very productive. There are a lot of literary texts that came into existence during this period. 
uh, in fact the best period are, are uh, uh, in terms of literature and philosophy are the spring and autumn period and the warring states period. Now during this period the Chou dynasty was very weak, it did not really control the entire land. In fact, China was divided into several kingdoms, smaller kingdoms which fought with one another for domination. But that helped in, in, in development of, uh, in the intellectual development of China because each king uh, had several advisors and thinkers who, who, who wrote texts on governance, to, wrote texts on philosophy because they were competing with one another. So, it, you can compare that with say the, the Europe of the Enlightenment period. S several kingdoms fighting with one another, France, Britain, you know, uh, Germany, all fighting with one another and, and, uh, and uh, encouraging scholars, financing them, you know, competing, trying to be the best. So, so, so during this, this period, China was also like that. Different states were competing with one another to be the best. As a result, the best literature, the best philosophy were actually came out during this particular period. Okay? So, so that is the Chou dynasty. Now, in turn, the last uh, Chou ruler of obviously was weak, he was not able to retain his power and he was overthrown by King Chang, okay, who, who belonged to the Qin dynasty and it is King Chang who took the title of Shri Wang Ti, okay, the first emperor. Uh, if you want to see uh, like uh, the first emperor in action, uh, you can watch uh, this movie, the third mummy movie. Uh, what is it? What is it called? It was called, I think, uh, I don't remember right now. Anyway, Jet Li plays the role of Emperor Sri Wangti, who is brought back to life. And so, actually, uh, Sri Wangti believed that he will come back to life. If you go to Xi'an in China, there is a terracotta army created by uh, Sri Wangti, where he is buried. So, he believed that he will come back to life one day and he, for that uh, and he wants to rule over everyone again uh, and so he needed an army. So, he created an army made of terracotta with all the chariots and horses, everything is there, weapons and all that. He believed that all, all, all of those will come back to life and he will rule over the world again. And now, Sri Wangti was a very cruel ruler and so there were a lot of rebellions against him. Uh, and therefore, the Qing dynasty, Qin dynasty does not last for a very long time. Now, now note down this name, Qin. The word China comes from Qin. Okay, actually, uh, the word Qin is pronounced in, 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 in Sanskrit as Qin, China. Okay, so from China, Sanskrit China, it became China because from India, this word then traveled to the, to the west. And, and, and so, they started calling the country ruled by the Qin as China. Okay? The Chinese themselves do not call their country as China, they call their countries as, as I told you, Chung Kuo, Middle Kingdom. Okay? So, this is a very interesting thing. So, Qin, China comes from the Qin dynasty. Another word is Han. Okay? So, the Chinese speaking people are known as the Han Chinese people. Okay? So, their mother tongue is Chinese, although they are different dialects. Uh, in fact, some dialects cannot be understood. So, if you know Mandarin, you cannot understand Cantonese, completely different. Uh, but uh, in terms of writing system, they have a common writing system. So, if you write in the Chinese script, so a person speaking Cantonese, a person speaking ma Mandarin can both understand it. Although they will pronounce the words differently, but uh, the meaning is the same. But if they talk with one another, they cannot understand each other, Okay, unless of course, they are familiar with the, the other language. So, anyhow, so, so the, the Han dynasty rule is considered to be a golden age. So, it was founded by uh, Liu Pang. Liu Pang was the, was the peasant and he uh, uh, overthrew the Qin dynasty and became the first ruler of the Han dynasty. Now, the Han dynasty ruled from a capital known as Chang'an, which is also known as Xi'an. So, I may already mentioned Xi'an. Okay. So, this has, was the traditional capital of China. Beijing uh, became the capital of China later on, okay, in the later period. At this time, Chang'an used to be the capital of China. Another, another city was Luoyang. Okay. This also used to be capital. Whenever 
and a, a, a ruler became weak or a dynasty became weak, they used to shift their capital from Chang'an to Liu Wang. You have seen, we, we see this, couple of instances, we see this example. Now, some of the achievements of Han dynasty. Now, Han dynasty created a synthesis of legalism and Confucianism. Sri Wangti ruled China purely through the means of legalism, through rewards and punishment. And so, people did not like that type of a rule because it was very strict. Uh, so, the Han dynasty retained some of the policies of Sri Wangti and so, so they retained uh, portions of legalism, but they also introduced Confucianism because Confucianism depends on tradition and rituals in order to control the people, which is a more efficient way because, uh, because rewards and punishment is like people get very upset and people are always in fear and people do not want to be always in fear. While uh, if, you, if you follow Confucianism, it is not about fear, but it is about rever reverence and tradition and, and, and following the ways of the ancestor. So, that is a better way of governing the people. And so, they created a synthesis of legalism and Confucianism. As a result, the Han dynasty ruled for a very long time, almost 400 years as you can see here, uh, more than 400 years. They also introduced, because Han empire was a huge empire. Okay, so they also introduced the Silk Road. Okay, so from China, there was a road going all the way into the into Europe and the Roman Empire, and connecting Persia, India, and so this, uh, there was a flourishing of trade. Also, Buddhism went into China through this route, particular route. Okay, so so Han Dynasty period was very good for trade, commerce, and ideas, religion, and so on. Uh, another great achievement is recording of history, uh, Sima Qian, uh, the great uh, historian who wrote uh, the famous work, Records of the Grand Historian, Sima Qian. He, he basically uh, wrote down the history of China up to that point in a very systematic way, uh, considered one of the great works of history, uh, comparable to say, Thucydides history of the Peloponnesian War, okay, Sima Qian's records of the grand historian. Of course, there was also social economic improvement in China during this period. Paper was invented early on during this, this Han dynasty period. Uh, the, the northern tribes were also defeated. Okay. Uh, Xiong Nu, Xiong Nu. Okay, was a northern tribe which was always attacking China and Chinese people were very fearful of it. And because of this Xiongnu tribe, uh, Sri Wangti created the Great Wall of China to defend uh, his, his uh, empire from, from these tribes. Eventually, during the Han dynasty period, they were defeated and they became tributaries of the Chinese empire. Okay, so, this everything went on very well uh, until the later Han rulers who were also weak. So, again, Mandar have been withdrawn. So, Xi'an was the last. Han emperor, he was also weak and so he was overthrown and then began a period of disunity in China. So, for a long time, uh, more than 300 years, 300, more than 350 years, there were multiple kingdoms and dynasties in China. Okay, So, this is how the ancient period ends in China. Then we move to the medieval period. So, China was again reunited by the Sui dynasty, Okay, 581 CE. China was reunited by the Sui dynasty. Uh, capital again was Chang'an. Emperor Wen of uh, Emperor Wen of uh, Sui was able to reunite China. Now Sui dynasty is uh, also uh, has achieved a lot. It was a very brief period it ruled over China. As you can see, um, how many years? It's about thirty odd years. Thirty years, that almost forty years. Not much for a dynasty. So. Sui dynasty is famous for, for building the Grand Grand Canal. Grand Canal was created by the Sui dynasty. They, this Grand Canal is an artificial river that connects the Yellow River with the Yangtze River. Yangtze River is the largest river in China. Yellow River, of course, uh, I have already discussed. So, this Grand Canal is an artificial river which connects these two and, and then irrigates the entire land between these two rivers and this adds to you know, navigation and irrigation and so many other things. And so, the Grand Canal becomes a kind of a foundation for a prosperous China under the Sui dynasty and then utilized by the succeeding dynasties.
Now the Sui dynasty wanted to conquer Korea and they were unsuccessful and the last ruler was, was killed in that process and uh, it was again replaced by a new dynasty, the Thang dynasty. Thang dynasty like the Han dynasty was a, a dynasty that ruled entire China for a very long period of time. So this is also known as another golden age. So one golden age is the Han dynasty period, the second golden age is the uh, Thang dynasty period. And Chang'an again was the capital, Xi'an or Chang'an. So, Li Yuan was the first Tang emperor. Under the Tang dynasty, China was the largest empire in the world, the largest population in the world. In terms of GDP, you can say the largest GDP in the world. They introduced a criminal code. You know, imperial exams were improved, they were more systematized. Art and literature flourished. Printing was introduced, woodblock print printing was introduced, first time in the world in China. Clock, the first types of clocks were created, gunpowder was uh, uh, invented, the Silk Road was revived, you know, and it was also a period of kind of a intellectual conflict between Buddhism on the one hand, Taoism and Confucianism on the other. Okay, so, so this Buddhism, the, the new thing in China, the most popular religion there, um, was challenged by the indigenous Chinese ideas like Taoism and Confucianism. There was a lot of conflict between them during this period. But conflict is not bad always. It, as I as I had said before, the conflict often leads to intellectual development. Tang Dynasty was followed by the uh, instable period, and then soon Song Dynasty emerged. Now Song Dynasty did not rule over entire China. The northern parts of China, there were some other dynasties ruling over uh, that area. But Song Dynasty was famous because uh, of of the prosperity that China had during that period. The conflict between these three uh, thoughts, Buddhism, Taoism and Confucianism was resolved finally during the Song period when they created something known as Neo-Confucianism and uh, the exam system also came into its, its modern form during that time. Okay, there were three levels of exams we had to pass to become a civil servant in, in, in the Chinese state. Movable type, type printing was also introduced, it was a very prosperous period, shipbuilding developed, they built very large ships, architecture developed during this period. Okay, this is actually Song dynasty period is considered to be the most prosperous period in Chinese history. Okay, Nanqing, a new capital, Nanqing was also created. So, Peiching and Nanqing concept actually emerges gradually in this period. Also. So, Nanqing, the name was not there at that time, but eventually that, that the, the Song capital came, came to be known as Nanqing. Anyhow, so the Song dynasty was replaced by the Yuan dynasty. Now, Yuan dynasty was founded not by Han Chinese people, but by the Mongols. Genghis Khan, he, he basically um, defeated the Chinese and, and captured China. His grandson, Kublai Khan, he became the, he declared himself to be the Chinese emperor and uh, he uh, inaugurated the Yuan dynasty. Now, this, now, the Yuan dynasty was the largest empire in China. Okay, it was larger than the Tang dynasty, larger than the, uh, the Han dynasty. So, places like Tibet, Mongolia all became part of the Chinese empire under the Yuan dynasty. It is not that the Chinese people conquered Tibet or Mongolia, it is Mongolians who conquered China. Okay, so, in that way, Mongolia and Tibet became part of of, of China. In fact, Tibetan Buddhism became the official religion because the Mongols were followers of the Dalai Lama. Okay, so, so Tibetan Buddhism became the state religion and, and these two capitals, Peiching and Nanqing became the two capitals, northern capital, Peiching, Pei means north, Nan means south, Qing means capital. So, Peiching simply means northern capital, Nanqing means southern capital. Now, the Chinese people were, uh, although uh, you know, uh, the, the Mongols brought a lot of glory to China, uh, ultimately it was foreign rule. So, so there was a revolt against the Yuan dynasty and Yuan dynasty was replaced by the Ming dynasty. So, the Ming dynasty, it overthrew, so a person known as Chu Yuan Chong, he overthrew the, the Mongols and established the Ming dynasty. So, this was an indigenous uh, Han Chinese dynasty, okay, it was established in 1368. Although the size of that uh, Ming Empire was smaller than the Mongol Empire, obviously. So, Tibet and Mongolia were separated from China during this period. 
Now this uh, dynasty is famous for the voyages of Cheng He. Okay, Cheng He was a great uh, Chinese admiral who built, uh, who had large ships and he uh, traveled to different parts of the world using those ships and uh, he shocked and awed different peoples and, and uh, spread the glory of the Chinese civilization. In fact, he, he, in some places he overthrew the local kings and established his own candidate as kings. In fact, the a king in Sri Lanka was brought all the way to China to kowtow for the Chinese emperor and so on. But eventually, uh, so this this uh, this voyages of Cheng He uh, were from fourteen not five, fourteen not five to fourteen thirty three. So this is the period of Cheng He's voyages. Now this is the peak of the power of the Ming dynasty. And this is much before the Europeans began to navigate the world. So before Europeans, Chinese had al already started navigating the world. And perhaps if, if this process continued, China could have emerged as a colonial power. But there was a reaction against Chang'e's voyages within China. The Confucian uh, officials did not like these voyages. They were perhaps jealous of uh, Chang'e and people like him. And so eventually navigation or navigation to deep seas was banned in China. All these large ships that Chang'e traveled in were all burned and destroyed. And China went into a period of isolation, okay, at, at a time when European powers were emerging. And so, so eventually Portuguese followed by the Dutch were able to get access to China during the Ming dynasty period. Now, Ming dynasty of course also declined and Another foreign dynasty, Qing dynasty was established in 1644. These are the Manchus. Okay, these are north of the Great Wall of China. So the Manchus crossed the Great Wall, they captured China and established the Qing dynasty. And just like the Mongols, the Manchus were also able to build this huge empire of China. Okay. So under so initially, of course, the Qing dynasty was very powerful, but in the 19th century, its power began to decline because you know, China was very isolated from the world. It had a lot of things, but Europe was going far, far ahead in terms of military technology, industrialization and so on. So eventually, the Europeans were able to uh, defeat the Qing dynasty and start a period of colonialism in, in China. So we are going to discuss this uh, perhaps sometime later. So uh, after uh, Qing dynasty was eventually overthrown in uh, 1911. Right now, I am just discussing from a point of view of Mandate of Heaven. So, last Chinese emperor was Emperor Puyi. There is a very famous movie uh, based on the life of Puyi, The Last Emperor. So, I would suggest that you all watch that movie. It is a very long movie, but it is very beautiful. And it, and, and it gives us a picture of ancient China and also how that ancient China transformed into modern China. Then there was a period of Republic of China when China had a a Republican form of government with a president, which which uh, lasted till 1949, when after the civil war, first the Japanese uh, uh, captured large portions of China. The Second World War happened, and then the Japanese were defeated, and then there was a civil war between the Republic of China and the Communist Party, and so on. First of October 1949, the rule of the Communist Party of China was established under the leadership of Mao Tse. So Mao Zedong was the first leader of communist China. He ruled over China from 1949 till his death in 1976. Now Mao was a very interesting leader. He, he was very radical in his orientation and he was very suspicious and violent type of a person. You know, he, he did not even trust his own communist party and so uh, he, he launched different movements you know, which, which, which basically purged the Chinese society from time to time from what he called as capitalistic elements, including uh, the leadership of the Communist Party during the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. And so by when uh, Mao died, uh, the, the leaders of Communist Party, they decided to reverse the policies of Mao Zedong. They were not happy with it. Now, the successor of uh, Mao was Hua Kuofeng, who was not a very influential person. He was the Mao, Mao appointed him as his successor because uh, he came from the same province as Mao. And he was a nobody and so he believed that Huo Ko Feng will retain whatever changes Mao had brought about in China. And so uh, the policy of Huo Ko Feng was known as two whatevers 
whatever Mao said was right and whatever Mao did was right. That was his policy. So, he continued Mao's policy. At the same time, he also, uh, you know, removed those people who were responsible for the cultural revolution known as the Gang of Four. Gang of Four, which also included Mao's fourth wife. Uh, so, they were all arrested by Huo Kuo Feng and he, he took over power himself. But he did not have any vision and he did not have any influence within the uh, People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Communist Party military or within the uh, Communist Party because he was not a very senior leader. Instead, Tang Xiaoping, who was a very senior leader within the Communist Party, gradually emerged as the paramount leader. Although the, he did not hold the official post of head of state or something like that, he controlled the Chinese military through the uh, military commission, the Central Military Commission. So, from 1978 to 1989, Tang Xiaoping was practically the ruler of China. So, Tang Xiaoping opened up China to reforms, market economy, so on and so forth and Chinese economy began to grow and all the wounds created by the movements launched by Mao were gradually healed. But people were quite uh, optimistic, you know, they wanted a lot of change. They also wanted democracy. Now, Tang Xiaoping did not believe in democracy. He wanted economic reforms, he wanted market economy, but he did not want uh, the power or the rule of Communist Party to be challenged. Okay, so he did not want any elections in China. So, when the students um, in China in 1989, they gathered in Beijing protesting and demanding democracy, he sent the tanks. Okay, so that is the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989. He crushed the democratic movement, ensured that the control of the Communist Party is restored and after some time he, and under the leadership of the next leader, Chiang Zemin, who was appointed by Tang Xiaoping, uh, new uh, set of reforms were introduced after 1993. And China went from a kind of a uh, poor developing country into the second largest economy in the world it is today. So, Chiang Zemin was then re replaced by Hu Jintao and, uh, and then he was replaced by Xi Jinping. Okay, so, Chinese, you can see Chinese history has been very neatly described in terms of dynasties and rulers and this continues up to now. Okay, you can see uh, Jiang Zemin period, then there is a Hu Jintao period, there is a Xi Jinping period which is going on right now, so on and so forth. Okay, so, so Mandarin of Heaven is a very interesting concept. As you, as you see and, and uh, often the, the whole Chinese history is described in terms of Mandela Heaven. In fact, when Mao died in 1976, there was a huge earthquake in China. Okay, and and uh, for the Chinese people, it indicated the change in the Mandela of Heaven. So, the Mandela had passed from Mao to a new generation who would, which would introduce a new type of policy, policy of reforms in China. I will just summarize for you what we have done today. Okay, so, we discussed the mandate of heaven, we discussed these different concepts, the concept of Thian, heaven, which is kind of an impersonal cosmic law that governs everything and, and, and the concept of the son of heaven, who is an intermediary between and, and, and the people who per perform such in rituals and has to be virtuous, so on and so forth. Uh, then the concept of Thian Sia, all under heaven, the, so the emperor, the Chinese emperor rules over everything under heaven. And that is known as the mandate of heaven. And then we discuss the characteristics of the mandate of heaven. That is heaven that grants the emperor the right to rule. Since there is only one heaven, there can be only one emperor. Virtue determines the right to rule and no dynasty has the permanent right to rule. And based on these ideas, we discuss the different dynasties that have come in China. First being the Xia dynasty, then the Shang dynasty, then the Zhou dynasty, then the Qin dynasty, then the Han dynasty. Then there is a period of disunity and then we see the medieval period beginning with the Sui dynasty, reunites China, replaced by the Tang dynasty. Then we have the Sung dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, which is a foreign dynasty. Mongols found the Yuan dynasty. Then we have the Ming dynasty, which is again an indigenous Chinese dynasty. Then it is replaced by the Qing dynasty, which is again a foreign dynasty uh, of the Manchu people. But today, of course, Manchu people are part of, uh, Manchuria is part of China. And in fact, uh, majority of the people in Manchuria today are Han Chinese. They're, the Manchu separate identity of the Manchus has gradually been eliminated. But uh, you know, the, during the, the Manchu rule, the Manchus were considered to be foreigners. And one of the reasons to overthrow the 
the Qing dynasty was that it was a foreign rule. Okay, the, the father of modern China, Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen is considered to be the father of modern China, both in, in People's Republic of China as well as in Taiwan. One of the reasons he wanted to overthrow the Qing dynasty was because it was a foreign dynasty. Okay, and so we have the Republic of China again. And during this period, uh, it's a period of instability, China was not united. There were several warlords which ruled over different parts of China. Uh, Kuomintang was the main political party during this period. And the Japanese then invaded, occupied large portion of China. Only after the Japanese were defeated, China became free. But then it went into a period of civil war between the government of the Republic of China, led by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek. He was the uh, president of China, Republic of China. So he fought against the communist under Mao Zedong, but eventually the communists were able to establish their rule in China. So right now, China is ruled by the Communist Party of China. So I stop here. Uh, we will do uh, lecture 3 uh, next time. So thank you very much. Traditional Chinese thought, the Confucian cosmology. So it's, it's named after Confucius, but this traditions of Chinese thinkers. And to an extent, even today in China, although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So, uh, according to the Confucian, the top, then below is the earth, heaven at the top, earth at the bottom, son of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance we will say the Chinese state. So, according to the Uh, an intermediary between heaven, which is and us. So, state plays a very important role in Chinese. The whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo, the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation. Qing, the capital where the government resides. So, government is at the center and then there is the Chinese. There are the tributaries and the barbarians. Those people who accept the greatness of Chinese tributaries and those who refuse to challenge Chinese supremacy are the barbarians. So, this is kind of a basic structure of Chinese foreign policy gives maximum importance to its own people, its own and then it has friendly relations with those countries which those who are ready to accept Chinese conditions, China liberally uh, uh, gives them what they want. But those China, who challenge Chinese hegemony, they are considered with suspicion and does not cede even a, an inch of uh, these countries which, which are barbarians. So, we must Chinese cosmology while uh, the, the Confucian cosmology. Thank you.